Hi, I'm Ron Jackson, and in this presentation, I will be introducing a new composite resin, especially designed for posterior use, along with a uniquely designed sonic handpiece, which is used to deliver the composite to the prepared cavity quickly and efficiently in a single bulk fill increment. The name of the product is Sonic Fill, and is by the Kerr Corporation. Let's face it, placing posterior composite resin restorations is an exacting, tedious, and time-consuming procedure. It includes obtaining the necessary isolation, selecting and placing the appropriate matrix, precise execution of the adhesive steps, the placement of a flowable resin or a resin ionomer liner, and finally, the placement and adaptation and light curing of incremental layers of composite, at least two or more layers. Add to this, adjusting the occlusion, finishing and polishing, and you have a procedure which just takes too much time. Simply stated, SonicFill is a system for the efficient placement of posterior composite restorations. As I mentioned earlier, this system consists of a new composite developed by Kerr, which comes loaded into a specially designed unit dose tip, and it utilizes a specially designed sonic handpiece. Used together, this technology will significantly change the way posterior composites are placed. What SonicFill actually does is to shorten the tedious and time-consuming placement process down to a single step accomplished in seconds. Additionally, because the composite resin lends itself to a rapid sculpting and finishing technique, which I will be demonstrating, many dentists will see a time savings of 10 to 15 minutes per restoration. What's more, the savings in time does not come at the expense of quality. In fact, in terms of density and adaptation, you may even see an improvement. Before going into the treatment room and demonstrating the technique on a patient, I want to take a few minutes to discuss the concept of sonic fill, starting with the handpiece. When sonic energy of a specific amplitude is applied to a correctly matched thixotropic composite resin, it causes intense, extremely rapid molecular vibration, resulting in rapid drop in viscosity. When the sonic energy is stopped, the viscosity begins to increase and return the composite to a sculptable state. When the handpiece is activated, liquefaction begins. What is actually happening is a shear stress is being applied at the molecular level, and viscosity drops almost immediately. Not to what we consider to be a flowable state, but it gives the same intimate adaptation to the cavity walls without any bubbles or voids. And now, let's look at the composite resin. In this graphic of mechanical properties, it is seen that sonic fill is highly filled by weight and has low volumetric shrinkage. Regarding the other physical properties, sonic fill meets the standards for a high performance posterior composite. Obviously, for a bulk fill procedure, depth of cure is important. One measurement of depth of cure is to cure a column of composite and measure the hardness of the top and the bottom of the column. It is desired that the hardness of the bottom be at least 80% of the hardness value at the top. Looking at the graph, a 5 millimeter column of sonic fill, shade A2 or A3, exceeds the desired 80% with just 20 seconds of curing when using a halogen light, such as the Optilux 501, or when using an LED, such as the Demi, the 80% is exceeded in just a 10 second cure. So let's review the highlights of sonic film. Upon activation, sonic energy lowers the viscosity and extrudes the composite. The composite immediately adapts to the cavity walls without voids. Cavities of five millimeters or less are filled in one bulk increment. And that represents, by the way, over 80% of the cases. 
Upon deactivation, the viscosity increases for sculpting. The composite is non-sticky and non-slumping, which allows for accurate morphology to be established quickly. The material can be light cured on each surface, occlusal, facial, and lingual, for 20 seconds with high power halogen, such as the Optilex 501, or just 10 seconds with high power LED, such as the Demi. So the bottom line is, after curing the adhesive, the cavity is rapidly bulk filled with a highly filled restorative composite. The result is excellent adaptation and good to very good aesthetics with a single shade and single opacity. So now, let's go into the treatment room and see just how well Sonicfill performs. Here we are in the treatment room, and before I begin, I'd like to introduce my clinical assistant, uh, Geraldine Dickinson, and our patient for the day, uh, Dr. Bob Galagos. Dr. Galagos has an amalgam in the lower left quadrant, tooth number 20, which has an amalgam in it, and Dr. Galagos would like to have uh, the amalgam replaced with a composite. Before beginning, um, I'd just like to show uh, my magnification system. I believe uh, it's best to do all dentistry under magnification, and certainly I do all my dentistry under magnification. Uh, these are uh, new kinds of loops. Uh, they're called revolution, and they're bioroscoptic. In the past, I've always had difficulty uh, deciding whether to get flip up uh, or fixed through the lens type of magnification. As you can see, uh, this is a hybrid. This actually gives me both. This gives me a uh, fixed through the lens, TTL magnification, but I also have the convenience of a flip-up mode. You'll probably also notice that I'm using a LED headlamp. Um, this is a headlamp which is um, wireless. It's from Discovery, which is also uh, an oroscopic co uh, company. When it gets to, to the back of the mouth, uh, things get dark, and so uh, I always like to do my dentistry, at least in the posterior, uh, with a headlamp. And this one's also kind of convenient because it has a, uh, a filter on it uh, so that when we are placing composite by flipping down the filter, uh, it won't prematurely polymerize our composite. So our patient is numb and we're ready to begin. And Dr. Galagos is a dentist and as you can see, he has one final amalgam left that he'd like to have replaced by a composite restoration. Amalgam uh, has been in there and serviced very well for many years. Um, it's clear, however, when you look at the um, distal uh, facial margin uh, that it's open and beginning to leak. Uh, some of the discoloration that we see um, uh, around it could either be uh, potential new caries or uh, just leaching of the uh, metal ions, uh, giving it that blue cast. Certainly, uh, when we're all finished, uh, our goal, our objective is to uh, have a restoration, a composite restoration, well sealed, uh, which is the job of the adhesive. Um, and we should also expect to get some tooth reinforcement. Uh, we can remain conservative. Uh, if there is any decay or any unsupported enamel seen at when, after the uh, restoration, any potential caries is removed, uh, even though there would be unsupported enamel, the beauty of, of composite uh, and the adhesion uh, and reinforcement that we get from the adhesive, why uh, we, we can leave unsupported enamel around uh, and um, uh, support it with the uh, bonding to the enamel walls. And then finally, um, which is something very important to most patients, um, is that we should end up with a, uh, a naturally looking uh, restoration. Looking at the x-ray, uh, we can see of this uh, 20 plus year amalgam filling that all margins are in enamel, including the gingival margin. And that's a good thing for our bonded composite because our best bonds, uh, pretty much leak free bonds, are our enamel bonds. Um, we also notice that there's a good size base or liner underneath this amalgam. We're ready to proceed, and the first step is to gain proper isolation. And my preference is the rubber dam. In my opinion, there is no better way of total isolation than utilizing the rubber dam. 
I will also isolate the entire quadrant. Even though working on a tooth in the middle of the quadrant, just a single restoration, it makes a lot of sense just to go from the last tooth in the arch up to the midline and we'll place a bite block to help the patient's muscles. They don't get so tired and a napkin just for comfort purposes. But by going from the very last tooth up to the midline, and that's the way I do it uh, all the time working on a posterior tooth, it gives us tremendous access, uh, opens everything up for visual and as well as for uh, getting our hands in here. I also have another little trick that I'll be showing, which uh, will increase and improve and give us maximum isolation. Okay, so now we're going to use a close-up because I'd like to illustrate a tip which I feel is extremely important and in fact guarantees 100% isolation. And that tip is to place a ligature around the tooth that's being treated using wax floss. So I'm going through the contacts so that I have the ends on the buckle is to go twice, that is what's called the surgeon's knot, looping that twice. And now we'll come close up right down onto the tooth. And when I pull this knot tight, and you can see, look what it does. It drops the rubber dam to the bottom of the sulcus. And because I've done the surgeon's knot, it's locked. And then we'll do the double knot, Boy Scout knot, which is one more knot to lock it in place. And we'll cut that knot very short. And so what you have now, looking really close up, is the rubber dam pulled to the bottom of the sulcus, the tissue is on the other side of the dam, we have isolation such that there will be no leakage in the operative site. And what that means is as I go through the adhesive steps, um, I've got 100% isolation and don't have to worry about the seepage from the cellular fluid. And it gives me a very high and dry margin, as you can see, a uh, gingival margin. Okay, so we're ready to remove the amalgam. Prior to doing that, we'll change our gloves. And the reason for that is the gloves get contaminated as you're working in the mouth. And if we now switch to a clean set of gloves and since the mouth now is completely isolated with the exception of the teeth there's no way I can pick up saliva or blood or anything else um, uh, bodily fluid on my gloves hands now this enables us to touch things off the field without taking contamination from in the mouth uh, to items that are off the field uh, nice little method of, uh, of uh, approach. And I've selected the sectional matrix system today by Triodent. And so I'm inserting now a sectional matrix, dead soft pre-contour matrix by Triodent. Comes with these prong pliers which allows for a easy placement. Uh, we'll place a wedge which also uh, has a little hole in the back of it. And this wedge is going to be a little bit too small so we'll choose a larger one. This is also by uh, Triodent. And the purpose of the wedge, of course, is to close that gingival margin and give us a seal. Uh, the ring, stabilizing ring, which comes as a V, um, if that can be seen, uh, the V, that gives you space for the wedge. Rather than crowding the wedge out, the wedge fits right into the V on the buccal and uh, lingual surface uh, and we have slight separation here because of the stabilizing ring. We have the adaptation of the matrix to the proximal walls and now all I'm doing is just burnishing that contact. I can push this little tab out of the way and we'll get a nice close-up view showing the adaptation uh, of the matrix. The matrix is in position wedge is in position. You can see that we have a closed sealed gingival margin. We had adaptation of the matrix to the proximal walls. Today I'm going to be using a three-step 
total etch technique using Optibond FL by Kerr. So we'll begin with etching the enamel and after I've gone all around the enamel margins I will then fill up the tooth and count to 12. Uh, this technique ensures that the enamel will get etched 15 plus seconds since it takes some time to go all around the enamel margin and since it takes a couple of seconds, two, three seconds to fill the cavity from the bottom up, what happens then is it gives me a enamel etch of 15 plus seconds and a dentin etch of 15 minus seconds. We'll begin with the enamel. We'll go down the proximal, across the gingival margin, up the facial, and then just fill the tooth up. I like to etch beyond the cavo surface margin. I'm doing that intentionally. At this point, we're going to count to about 12. I will dry everything outside the matrix band, not blowing any air into the tooth structure. The assistant will briefly suction over the tooth. And at this point, I'm going to go ahead and add some chlorhexidine. This is a material called Concepsis from Ultradent. And the chlorhexidine is not just used as an antimicrobial, but also to inhibit the so-called proteases or collagenases within dentin that are stimulated to activity from the acid etch procedure. And this will inhibit them. Now, we would like to achieve the correct amount of so-called wet moist or damp dentin. So the system is suctioned over the uh, chlorhexidine, the concepsis, and I'm going in and just blot a little bit to obtain the right. And what we're looking for here is a barely glisteny uh, surface. We don't want it dull. We don't want it dry. And I'm applying now the Optibon FL primer, and I like to apply the primer with at least a couple of very sloppy wet coats. We don't want to underprime; it can be a hazard in total etch procedure. So another coat using a little bit smaller, and as you can see, I'm scrubbing somewhat, or certainly agitating. And then we'll go ahead and dry. The drying procedure, we would like to dry the alcohol solvent, but leave the hydrophilic monomer, which is what is in the primer, uh, on the dentin. So I'm going to start by blowing gentle air across the tooth, and then I'll gradually increase the airflow until the surface is dry. And if we go close up right now, what we want to make sure we've done through inspection now, is that we have a completely glossy surface, just as you see there, every bit. If there's going to be any dull surface anywhere, uh, it would be seen in those deep stained areas of dentin. But as you can see, we have a complete glossy surface. So that means now step three, which is uh, the organic resin last coat, just coating the whole surface with the resin, the third step of a three-step etch rinse procedure, and I'll just kind of thin this just a little bit. Not too much of a necessary there, since we're going to be adding composite resin. So we'll cure that now for 10 seconds with the demi. which is a high-powered LED light, in the neighborhood of, of 1,000 to 1,300 milliwatts per centimeter squared in that range there, high energy light. And so our adhesive is placed and cured, and the entire surface, as we can see on inspection, is all glossy. So there will be uh, a comfortable restoration. Before I used the Sonifil to fill the cavity, uh, I want to illustrate how 
the tip is placed onto the handpiece. It's merely screwed down until it locks in very tight. A couple of the instruments that I will be using right after the cavity is filled, and that happens extremely rapidly, so I'm going to describe this right now. You'll see the first instrument that I use will be a compo roller uh, by Kerr, and it has uh, different shapes of Teflon tips. And I'll use this to quickly roll the composite, if you will, adapting those occlusal margins and removing the excess. Immediately after doing that, which is only a couple of seconds, my assistant will hand me uh, an instrument, a plugging instrument on one end and a blade on the other. Actually, this is from a, uh, a kit of instruments that I designed for American Eagle. Uh, it's a posterior composite placement uh, kit. And so I'll quickly use these three instruments to uh, sculpt carve and shape, and that'll be a very rapid procedure as well, so which is why I wanted to describe them before we begin. One more other note that I want to make is that when the procedure is being done, uh, I will pr do the procedure with the, the um, uh, light filter, the orange filter, uh, over my LED light, so you're going to see a dimming of the light as the procedure occurs. And the point to note is how rapidly uh, the procedure is accomplished in one bulk fill increment. Before initiating the sonic energy, I just wanted to illustrate the access of the tip into the bottom of the cavity. It has an ideal curvature, and I haven't been able to find any area of the mouth that I could not reach with this tip. I'm going to initiate this. This will be a very, very rapid procedure, and the cavity fills up literally like that in seconds in a single bulk fill. The instrument being used first is the compo roller to smooth and actually kind of adapt as well as remove excess. Next I'll go to the American Eagle instrument starting with the plugger to a little bit more adaptation. I like to get my marginal ridge first and smooth that off down to the level that it should be, which is the opposite, the adjacent tooth marginal ridge. What I really want to point out here is the fact that the material at this point has not returned all the way to its un initiated state. Easily carvable, very easy to work with and shape, and so there basically is it. And so now uh, we'll cure uh, the sonic fill uh, using the LED Demi for just 10 seconds. Because of the depth of cure, of sonic fill and the fact that the cavity was less than five millimeters deep, we only need 10 seconds from the occlusal. We'll augment that once we remove the matrix band. And we'll begin doing that right now. The Trident system comes with these prong pliers, of course, that fit right into the holes of the wedge. So it's easy to remove that. We'll remove the stabilizing ring. And a little trick for taking the matrix out that you see the holes on the, uh, each side of the matrix. We teeter-totter this thing. We just grab that through the hole and then up and down and you'll see how simple and easy that matrix comes out. Before she augments the curing from the buckle and the lingual, I like to take the 12 blade on a scalpel handle and we begin removing the excess. Most of this is adhesive because the way that band adapts so well to the proximals. My assistant will go ahead now and cure, once again, 10 seconds from the buckle. And when it comes to measuring depth of cure, we'll get close to the tooth but not right on. She'll do it in two five second increments. In other words, she'll switch over because of the, sometimes the heat's produced in, um, uh, with these LED lights, these high-powered LED lights. So the 10 seconds will be done 
five seconds at a time from, uh, from the buckle and uh, lingual back and forth. And what I was about to say is that oftentimes when it's talking about depth of cure, the classical depth of cure is actually measured, well, there's two ways of measuring depth of cure. One is what I discussed in the lecture uh, where you measure the hardness of the uh, top and the bottom uh, after curing column of composite. And we desire to have an 80 percent, that is to say the bottom uh, have a Vickers hardness of 80 percent of the top. The other method of uh, measuring depth of cure, uh, the ISO standard, um, is to cure only from the uh, top or the occlusal um, a column of composite, scrape it away until you reach um, cured composite, scrape away from the bottom until you reach cur cured composite, and then you take that distance from top to where the bottom is hard, and it seems somewhat arbitrary to me, uh, but arbitrarily divide that in half and call that uh, the depth of cure. Uh, when uh, researchers measure depth of cure, however, um, they're only curing from the occlusal surface. And as you can see, we have augmented that occlusal surface cure by curing the same amount of time from the proximal, um, meaning the buccal, uh, and the lingual. So we're really uh, feeling very good, at least I'm feeling very good about the depth of cure of Sonicville material. Let's take a look at what we have now that it's fully cured, now that the Sonicville is fully cured, and prior to doing any of the um, uh, finishing steps um, or removing the rubber dam and, and adjusting the occlusion if necessary. What we see is a, a, certainly a nice contact. We see um, a well-adapted uh, composite. Um, on purpose, I etch and place adhesive beyond the cable surface margin. Uh, because on purpose, I want actually some flash. It's just my philosophy of posterior composites. Um, basically, some people say, well, you really don't want flash um, uh, on the occlusal surface of a tooth. Well, in fact, what is a sealant but nothing more than excess composite on the occlusal surface of a tooth? So if it's okay and sealants, why isn't it okay here? This actually I look at as just an extra protection uh, to my occlusal margin. So. Um, at any rate, I think we're ready to, in fact, uh, take off the rubber dam and adjust the occlusion and then do the f quick finishing and polishing steps. So I've removed the rubber dam and I've checked the occlusal contacts and it was only one small adjustment. We'll take some floss and go through. Moment of truth now. Get the image there and as you can see, We've got a nice contact in terms of finishing and polishing. This is also a very rapid procedure because finishing is very little. My purpose in finishing is not to remove the entire amount of flash. If I take an explorer now and I go around, uh, looking at the image, go around the tooth, uh, my objective is to feather any of the flash and I can hear a little bit there, and I think you can see it uh, in the picture that I've got just a little excess there that I, I've got to catch with my Explorer. When I come around here, I can see some right there. So my objective, and I'll do this dry with a 7404 carbide, and all I want to do is take and feather that flash, a little bit over here, we'll dry that again, and that's it, that's the entire finishing process. There's a nice system, and it's called Pro Gloss by Axis, and it's a one-step rubber finishing polishing system. And all I really want to do is remove, and this is used wet on medium speed, I'll slow it down, used wet medium speed, speed, and I'm really just kind of finishing those margins, and I'm going over the entire composite restoration, sonic field restoration, um, and really all my purpose is, is to remove the air inhibited layer. What you're going to see 
is a very, very smooth, and that's it. That's, that's my entire finishing smoothing. I've eliminated the air inhibited layer. To get the high shine, uh, I'm going to use a silicon carbide impregnated bristle brush called the Oclu brush, again by Kerr. And because this material is so smooth, there's really, there, there's really just nothing to use in terms of, of, of smoothing with rubber instruments and spending a lot of time doing it. But if I just take this, and I may have to use the point in order to get down into these fosses and grooves a little bit. But you'll get a high shine. Not that that is that significant. It's more for the pictures and you know, the initial uh, view the patient has of it. Before dismissing the patient, we'll take one final look. And of course, the restoration does look lower in value. But the reason for that is the teeth are very high in value. They've been desiccated for the time that they've been under the rubber dam. When the teeth rehydrate and drop in value, then you will see the blending of that restoration. We have a good contact, reasonably good anatomy, uh, certainly more than adequate finish and polish. Uh, margins look good, and so I think we're done.